All right. So what's a comprehensive approach? If any of you are working with cancer patients, you realize that there's a lot that you have to, to take into consideration. There's several things you want to be able to address. Obviously, the first thing is you've got to limit cachexia. You've got to prevent malnutrition in that cancer patient. It's incredibly important because 40% of patients with cancer will die due to malnutrition. Now, the next piece is, is secondary infection. A lot of cancer patients end up succumbing to secondary infection. So what do you do to help reduce that piece of the, of the uh, condition? Reduce direct and indirect effects of side effects of the chemotherapy, meaning that you know, if people are going to be on chemotherapy, what are you going to do to protect the kidneys? What are you going to do to protect the heart? What are you going to do to protect the liver? How are you going to keep immune competency in the gut? How do you enhance the effectiveness of chemotherapy if they're going to have chemotherapy? How do you enhance the effect of it? And how do you mobilize the immune defense system so that they're able to fight off that cancer more elegantly? Then it's how do you reestablish homeostasis? Redifferentiation of cancer cells and apoptosis. And then allow for a global assessment after that of exotoxin load, endotoxin load, nutrition status. And then in the end, of course, what we're all trying to do when we're trying to help people, whether in chronic inflammatory conditions or in cancer, is reestablish neuroendocrine and immune modulation. So it's important that we begin to look at these cases and go, okay, we've got a lot more to do than just kill the cancer, right? So what we're going to talk about today in, in part is about, first of all, the Warburg effect, but more than that, how exactly do you begin to look at compounds that can have the kind of benefit that we're looking for in cancer patients that's easy for people to, uh, to utilize? So Warburg basically you know, got the Nobel Prize for uh, physiology in 1931, and he got that for his discovery of the whole effect of glycolysis in cancer cells or the glucose uptake in a cancer cell. Now, obviously, we know this through the use of uh, PET scans, and so we use a tagged sugar water because cancer cells take up sugar faster than a normal cell. And then basically, in a healthy cell versus a cancer cell, there's differences in how energy is derived. Obviously, in this case, in the cancer cell, uh, there's a lot more lactate, a lot more intracellular acidity that occurs because it's anaerobic metabolism and it's inefficient. Cell has to work much harder, and also in the byproduct of that, you begin to get more uh, use of an, um, eventually an immortal cell. Now, Albert St. Gorgie, 1937, Nobel Prize for in the discovery of vitamin C and also in the mechanisms of cellular metabolism. What St. Gorgie thought was that if 2,6-dimethylbenzoquinone uh, uh, could be synthesized and given, that that could be a way to block the Warburg effect in a cancer cell. And then St. Gorgi did some research in it, but in the 1980s what happened was there was a lot of, of uh, individuals uh, that said, you know what, this thing of modulating cancer growth is kind of nutty. We just got to try and figure out how to kill the cancer. So everything went to cytostatic research. Nothing went to modulation at a cellular level as to what's going on with a cancer cell. So, you know, basically with St. Gorgi's death, this research kind of went by the wayside. Now, St. Gorgi was kind of one of the real patrons of science in Hungary, so he had a lot of scientists that looked up to him. There was a Dr. Hidvigi that actually you know, took up his research, and Dr. Hidvigi actually ended up being able to, after, you know, when, after the fall of communism occurred, you were allowed to do independent research, but you know, Dr. Hidvigi had a little issue. He had to uh, figure out, well, oh, how am I going to afford that, which, you know, with enough effort, Dr. Hidvigi was able to get the funding that he needed to be able to do this research in creating this fermented wheat germ extract, which is very interesting. We're going to go through the data and go through some of the, uh, the results that occurred with it. And I think if you do any work with uh, cancer patients at all, and really not even to that effect, anytime you're trying to regulate inflammatory chemistry, so even in that pre-cancer syndrome X you know, type 2 diabetic, high insulin output individual, you've got a real opportunity to counterbalance that effect of that Th1 or Th2 dominance that's going on in that individual. 
So interestingly, this, this wheat germ extract. Now, the, the interesting thing is, this wheat germ extract, if you do a high-pressure liquid chromatography on it, it doesn't look anything like wheat germ. Uh, it is obviously been fermented. There's a lot of compounds in it that are no longer in regular wheat germ, so it's a little bit different than that. Let's take a look at some of the studies. And we're going to progress from in vitro studies to animal models to human studies. And once again, I know I've been in practice now 23 years, got a pretty you know, significant size institute in Cincinnati. You know, got a couple docs and dietitians and nurses and acupuncturists. And so you know, we do a lot of work, and, and I also do a lot of work on the research side. And it's not often that I find research like this where it is really tight and uh, exquisitely done. I mean, done to the point where you can go, you know what, I can see where this has benefit. And so let's take a look at the first study. This is a in vitro anti-proliferative activity study in jerk T leukemia cells. Now remember, we're going to get the human trials, but if you notice, the, after 24 hours, this is the effect of cell proliferation uh, on fermented wheat germ extract versus the cells after 24 hours uh, that are untreated. So a significant change there. Another in vitro test, which becomes even more important, MHC1, or major histocompatibility complex 1. That's the protein that coats a cancer cell, right? Viruses don't have that. That's why your immune system can attack it. But when you have a cancer cell spring up, it will coat itself with these proteins. So when you look at tumor MHC1 histocompatibility complex surface proteins here. When you give fermented wheat germ extract, and this is in vitro again, look at the control. This is the MHC1 percent activity. Now look at it with the, the fermented wheat germ extract. And I've got a lot, I mean, I've, a lot of cases I'll share with later, especially one in particular. Uh, of how effective this is in, in humans, actually. But let's go to the next step. So we see some things in vitro. Now, a colorectal xenograph. So, fermented wheat germ extract, significantly reducing the number of metastasis in the human colorectal carcinoma xenograph in mice. And if you look, once again, you're up at the level of metastasis here. Is it about 42%? And then we get down with the uh, fermented wheat germ extract, and it's at about 18%. Lewis lung carcinoma, same situation. Fermented wheat germ extract reduces the number of liver metastasis in Lewis lung carcinoma models. And I can tell you, I've got, uh, I've had a breast cancer case that I, I just have reviewed. She's at her four year now, four years of treatment. Breast cancer, mess to the liver, mess to the uh, bone, and mess to the brain. And uh, we've had her on this now for about three years, and she's taken more uh, you know, chemotherapy to try to keep this under control than really her oncologist that he's ever seen. Part of it's because this particular fermented wheat germ extract really reduces the side effect profile that relates to the chemotherapy, so you're able to take more. And there's a really nice study that shows that in children, actually. So, chemo prevention of colon cancer. So we, we basically take mice, we're going we're gonna to hit them with a toxin that's going to induce colon cancer, and then in the, if you look, 